So now we're carrying on the theme of hybrid solutions and our next presenter is going to give us some insight in terms of optimizing hybrid energy solutions for remote mines. It's my pleasure to introduce Tristan Jackson. Tristan is the Director of Smart and Distributed Energy at Advision. Hello everyone, good afternoon, and I am the last presenter of the day. The room is a little thinner than it was this morning, so congratulations, you've made it through to the almost the end, and I won't uh, take up much of your time because I know everyone is excited for that uh, cocktail hour coming up very soon. Also, fortunately, many of the presenters who are up here before me have said many of the most important things about energy systems for remote mines and optimizing them using hybrids. One of the topics that has been uh, left out a little bit up to now, which I would like to talk about, is the clicker not working. <laughs> also, the part of uh, the part of the cost, I can do this without slides if the slides end up not working, but they come at the, at the beginning of the project, the soft costs. And what I wanted to talk about this evening is how we have reduced soft costs in the design, the configuration, the sizing, and the optimization of energy systems by about 10x through the use of advanced software. Let me see if this is going to work. Not to worry. Well, I did say this would be brief, so that's all folks. No. Um, just kidding. But uh, I want to also point out that one of the most important parts of this whole effort in bringing renewable energy into the mining sector is collaboration. And uh, I was speaking earlier with, um, with the UV power folks who are, have done the, uh, the Degrassa mine in Australia that one also uh, saved me some time in my presentation. I had a slide on it as well because our company worked with UV as the, we were the lender's engineer for Arena, uh, which put financing into that project and a very good job by that team. Uh, what we brought, we assessed the design, we checked uh, is it in fact optimal, we worked on the, the lender's side of the table. And what we were talking about earlier today is how we can bring together in more ways on more occasions are complementary strengths. They, they were talking about the uh, free wind studies that they do. We also have a free assessment that we do. It's not about the wind. So if you're considering a hybrid energy system for your mine, you should definitely think about taking up UV on the free wind assessment and bring in our assessment which considers that component among the other technologies that you might implement. Let's see if this is working now. It's okay. What, uh, oh, there it goes. Um, so, sorry about the, the disruption with the slides. I'll reset slightly and just briefly uh, introduce what I was going to talk about, which is a few of the case studies we have from Australia, the approaches we use to modeling, uh, the, that soft cost piece I mentioned at the front end, and the lessons learned from those experiences. If you're not familiar with the Worley Parsons group, we're best known for power and energy in the traditional sense, a lot of work in hydrocarbons over the years, and about 15% of our business is with mines. So we've done a lot of work in the mining sector. We currently have about 27,000 people and are, uh, through an acquisition, expecting to a little more than double to about 60,000 people approximately by April. But what I think people may know less about from our experiences the work we've done on standalone remote systems and on uh, what I lead in the company, the smart and distributed energy systems. So we have done uh, hundreds of renewable energy projects, totaling around 31 gigawatts of projects in renewable energy around the world, but also we're getting close to our first hundred or so projects in the smart and distributed energy space, which are microgrids, solar plus storage, uh, wind plus storage, hybrid systems, energy systems that are distributed, meaning typically behind the meter, 
or at the distribution level of the grid, and smart, meaning they involve sensors, controls, computerization uh, to optimize those operations in real time. We've done these in some very difficult environments. So we're talking about remote mines and what, uh, what's possible. I was interested to hear from De Beers this morning that they were planning to, hoping to do a 100% renewable mine on Baffin Island. And they were asking, you know, is wind feasible here? We did build a microgrid in Antarctica um, now almost 15 years ago. And there the operating conditions, the wind speeds exceed 250 kilometers an hour and the temperature is below negative 30. Uh, and just last year, unfortunately, we did have a failure of one of those turbines. But after 14 years of, of successful operations, and the, the reason I wanted to share with you, yes, we have some of the harsh lessons learned, is that when we push the limits of engineering, sometimes things do break. Nevertheless, those lessons learned from conditions as harsh as Antarctica are things that we take back to the lab, we can learn from, and we can help in situations like De Beers is looking at on Baffin Island to achieve better results going forward. One thing I will say, and this, uh, I think the panel covered this as well in their last question about reaching 100% renewable, getting that last four or five percent is extremely challenging. So personally, I'm not a major advocate uh, for the 100% renewable mine. What we've learned from projects around, I'm sharing some of the ones we've done in Australia, but also around the rest of the world, is that really, you want to think about optimized energy systems. So our approach is to get as much economic value as we can out of the technologies that exist today. With uh, your load profile in mind, one of the larger uh, microgrids we've built in Australia is a 38 megawatt plant. There's a refinery at that port and it operates the port. We did not attempt to go to 100% renewable and we also did not install energy storage. What our modeling showed was that using a measure of natural gas and two wind farms was able to achieve the lowest levelized cost of energy. And what I expect to see over the rest of the century, even looking out to 2050, I don't expect to see a lot of 100% renewable mines except in those areas where the renewable resource is very attractive in parts of Africa and Latin America, some parts of Australia. But what we've seen more with small and islanded microgrids is the value in hybrid systems. So looking at reducing diesel uh, to the point where you're getting your lowest levelized cost of energy while ensuring reliable operations. To do that, we've been innovative in several different ways, including using tilt down turbines in areas where there's a risk, high risk of cyclones. If you're going to use renewable energy, you expose yourself to different risks. You hedge against fuel price volatility, but you're exposed to wind speed volatility. So using systems that can adapt in, as you get a weather forecast and know, you have the opportunity to tilt your wind turbine down, that can be, make the difference between whether or not uh, as you look at the risk in that area and your risk of equipment loss, your system is ultimately uh, the best economic choice. Another system that we've found useful in very extreme environments, we've talked a lot about the improving economics of lithium ion batteries, which are very important. But in extremely cold or extremely hot conditions, lithium ion is not always the best choice. That may change as the technology improves, but in a system uh, where we've achieved up to 95% renewable energy, the solution that fit best there was a flywheel. Now, flywheel technologies have also improved a lot, and they're going to continue to improve. When we're looking at extreme conditions in the far north of Canada, in harsh parts of the world, again, while lithium ion, I, I think it's one of those ones that hydrogen also was mentioned as it gets a lot of hype and then kind of fades away. Lithium ion takes the show on energy storage. Everyone's talking about it. I think there's been less conversations about flywheel energy storage, which is an older technology that has also seen significant advancements. So when we look at harsh environments, we really want to optimize around 
what is going to achieve the lowest levelized cost of energy there while providing that, uh, that reliability, that performance that you're looking for. And for us, we see that being hybrid systems, systems that include mechanical energy storage when there are extreme temperatures, systems that enable you to avoid extreme weather like the tilt down turbines, and including some amount of, uh, of the thermal generation still in the mix. I'll leave the degrusa mine to UV. I think they uh, covered the, uh, the story there very well. Back to the soft costs though. In that situation, that was done a couple of years ago, and in, uh, up to this point, we found a real bottleneck around the modeling part of the equation. We and others in the field, the industry standard is to use multiple different software tools for optimizing the economics in, of, uh, of the hybrid energy system at one level to looking just at the storage piece with another tool to looking just at the solar output with another tool, looking just at the wind, that's where UV perhaps has the differentiated capability now, but all these tools were uh, cobbled together and people were taking the output of one, downloading it, uploading it into the other, or splicing them with Excel. And that's still the industry standard in, uh, for most companies. So that bottleneck, we found feasibility studies were taking weeks to months, sometimes a year, to design a microgrid and costing hundreds of thousands of dollars also coming up with designs where the, even the person who designed it was saying, I'm not entirely sure, have I actually optimized this system? I've run over 400 simulations around my best guess of what the technology package could, should be. I've picked the lowest cost, but you know, I, I, I stopped modeling when I got tired <laughs> of doing it, as opposed to when I was 100% certain that I had an optimized solution and between the different tools that people still have to use, the industry standard now, it takes five or six different software tools to design a microgrid. And it takes many expert hours of time to use them. People are spending a lot of time on that front end piece of work. A lot of cost goes into it and it's still uncertain at the end have, has an optimal result been achieved. So, Seeing this bottleneck in the process over the last five years, our team has searched the market for who was producing the software tools, what were the best that people had built in-house, and we did, discovered one, the Zendi platform, uh, which is made by a team in San Diego based on over 17 years of research and development carried out at US National Labs. These are the labs that created, built, designed the internet. So they've spent over $700 million of US government money in research and development into the modeling of distributed energy systems. Out of that work, a set of analytical engines were created that do the math behind optimizing uh, over time series of power flows, not, uh, not for a static moment in time, but over the 24 hours of the day and over the days of the year, designing a system that will meet that load at the lowest cost while achieving the performance uh, goals that are required for that system, which are different for different mines. Each one is its own special snowflake. You don't need the same level of reliability in every case. But depending on the value that you place on reliability, including that into the equation, it's a very complex mathematical problem. You have competing options from if you can use grid energy, the price that you get at different times of day uh, from the utility. If you're fully islanded, you have to look at your possible fuel costs, the costs of different technologies. And somebody mentioned, uh, the, the last panel was talking about to achieve that 100% renewable, it's very hard, the last uh, few percent. It can be done, yes, but you also have to consider, if you're being serious about environmental impact, what is the embedded energy in those systems? To get that last four or five percent renewable may require an amount of solar uh, energy generation, an amount of lithium ion storage 
that if you look at what went into producing those technologies and look at the carbon footprint of building those solar panels relative to their value in displacing diesel for that last little percent, these are all competing priorities, which is very hard even to conceptualize in your mind, let alone to actually accurately account for when you're running an optimization process to arrive at the right sized set of equipment. If you take into consideration the embedded costs and embedded carbon footprint in different technologies, how the different uh, energy options that you may use from the grid power to gas to diesel are changing over the course of a day and over the course of a year, you run into a combinatorial explosion of mathematical complexity. And simulating that, you may take your best guess at a set of technologies and run a simulation, you have a levelized cost of energy, you may change the mix and run it again, but at some point you will exhaust yourself without having exhausted all of the possibilities. So an optimization problem run by a computer has huge advantages over a simulation carried out by a human. Uh, when we optimize using this tool that I'm talking about, which I'll walk you very quickly through the process and then let us all get to the drinks, it runs over 220,000 mathematical operations a second. And comparing that to, uh, often people ask me, how does this tool compare to Homer? And I ask them, how long does it take you to run 220,000 simulations with Homer? I say, well, I've never done it. I do a few hundred and I, I hope I've got it. So, having an optimization tool is a game changer. And for us, it's enabled uh, a compression of the time to results by over 90%. In some cases, questions that used to take several weeks, we can do in a couple of hours. So it's far better than 90%. And the, so the cost comes way down. And also we have confidence in the results. We know that we have an optimal outcome um, because the, the math behind the system produced by the U.S. National Labs is sound and has been validated by the Department of Energy, um, by, by the labs that built it, and in the market. So as a group, Worley Parsons does things from the front end through implementation of systems, through uh, operations and maintenance. My team sits in the front end part. So we do planning, design, optimization of energy systems, and for my team specifically, distributed energy systems. And to use the Zendi platform, the way it works is first we need to know what are the, what's the force ranked order of priorities that uh, an end user has. Are they primarily or only concerned with uh, cost savings or is, uh, do they have a reliability goal? Is the carbon footprint important? We put those in the, the order of importance to the end user. And then we need some site specific data. Where is it determines the available renewable resource. If you want to get finer than our data sets allow, you might want UV again to come in and put a pole up and, and measure wind speeds, but we have a global database of solar irradiance and wind data. So that, uh, based on the location, we know the renewable resource, also the temperature range that you're looking at over the year. We need to know exactly what is the expected energy mix, what are the costs of fuels, or of grid power if you can be grid tied. And then usually we constrain the, uh, uh, the set of options that the platform will choose from because in some cases people don't want to use a certain fuel or it's not available or maybe they don't want to pursue a large scale wind so we, we limit a little bit the solution space that the plan, uh, platform will select from and then Zendi it, hit the optimize button and it produces a standard set of auditable, bankable uh, financial pro forma a uh, customized microgrid or other distributed energy system design, um, a bill of materials, and a sequence of operation uh, that shows you how you should optimally run the tool, uh, or run, run your system rather, uh, in order to achieve that levelized cost of energy. Produces one-line diagrams and a, a technical report, and the sequence of operations, again, if you, if you look at over a day and over a year, uh, how your load profile is being matched by the different energy options that it's choosing from, the tool is selecting the least cost solution to match that load profile over the day and over the year. So, again, there has been a whole lot of work done, a whole lot of hours spent on designing 
and simulating and trying to come up with optimized systems. I'm sure some of you, um, the, the engineering and EPC companies in the room, have experienced the pain and frustration of trying to do this with the hodgepodge of different tools that exist. And maybe some of the investors have seen an array of different um, reports uh, or a set of results that they're comparing apples to oranges. And on the end user side, you may have had the question, how do I know this system is optimized? A lot of the companies offering them these days are technology vendors. And they may uh, tell you that the optimal system has a lot of their components in it and that you need triple redundancy everywhere. So having a standardized approach to showing what's the, the return from the project, having it be technology agnostic, uh, having it be driven by optimization algorithms we've found to be tremendously important, liberating, and of great value to end users. Wrapping that up on the lessons learned through the, the journey to finding this tool and working with the team that developed it, using it uh, on projects, we've found that the best projects are optimized for the use case as, as opposed to redundancy everywhere. Mentioned a little bit ago, you may have a different value to reliability and resilience if your operation is of uh, a type, there was one mentioned earlier, where it costs the mine $2 million a day to lose service. Your value on rel reliability is very high there. In other cases, we've seen uh, cost of lost service at a mine as low as uh, half a million dollars a day. So depending on your operation, you have to weigh how much are you going to invest in the system versus how much will it cost you to have a brief outage. We have seen that renewables and storage in hybrid systems are certainly competitive now. I wouldn't advocate, as I mentioned, I wouldn't advocate for going 100% renewable plus storage now. That's not usually the most economically viable approach, uh, or you could say almost never. Um, but certainly as part of a hybrid system, they are competitive now. Hybrid systems do offer the greatest flexibility. They offer you the best chance to ensure your operations while minimizing your levelized cost of energy. And when we talk about minimizing the cost of these systems, there's only so far you can go with the technologies. There's a market for solar panels and for storage, and it's coming down, uh, but it's at a sort of fixed rate. You can, you can see that trend. You can predict it. The soft cost piece is, is a bit of a game changer when you can compress the time to results um, by as much as some of the, the, these new software tools are enabling. That, I believe, is an area where uh, we haven't heard as much today, and it's one of the biggest step changes in making the decision about your mine operation, being able to answer that question, is it a go or no go, and determine the value uh, to your operation of an optimized system in hours or, or days instead of weeks or months, and in uh, a small investment, or in some cases, no investment. Uh, we do do free assessments, and there are also ways that you can share uh, the risk uh, with an IPP. So there's no risk to the mine. And being able to answer those questions at low or no cost in a, in a very short amount of time with an auditable, bankable result, we are confident in the results, that's uh, an area for um, really making a difference in your business. So if you, if you haven't yet uh, come across the Zendi tool, we'd be happy to introduce you to how it works and use it with you. Uh, we'd be happy to work with the likes of Yuvi to bring their WIND study into our overall system optimization. Final point here is really um, consider the full range of technologies, not, not just the hardware you install, but the tools that you use to design and install it with. Consider working with UV as well as working with Orly Parsons. We've had great success doing that already. We look forward to more collaboration. And really, consider this a problem that is going to take all of us. Bringing the best hardware technologies, bringing the best software, bringing the financing options, and collaborating together. That's the final thought I want to leave you with, and I hope that's what everyone's going to be talking about out in the cocktail hour, is how do we help each other? Is this problem of, of the impacts of mining is, uh, is a threat to the industry. We heard De Beers say, consumers are choosing synthetic diamonds because of the environmental and social impact of mining diamonds. And you don't want that to be your company. You don't want 
your company to have, to lose its social license to operate. And we don't either. What we want is to come together around this challenge and solve it together. I do think it will take all of us. I think it will take the, the UVs and their wind studies, Worley Parsons, Zendi, and, and what they can do uh, in, to reduce soft costs. We'd like to share that with you. We'd like to collaborate. And we'd like to see more talk about collaboration across the industry. So I know I promised you short, and that wasn't all that short. I blame it on the slide snafu in the beginning. That wasn't my fault. But I, I am thankful all of you stayed through to the end. I really appreciate your being here. I hope that I was able to say something coherent and interesting in all of that, uh, that final pitch of the day, that we think together about this and we collaborate. So I'll leave it at that. <laughs>